lack of social interaction, easy access to weapons, and a growing hatred for society, these were the perfect ingredients for two brothers to decide to kill as many people as they could. Robert and Michael made a plan to make criminal history, but to start, they need to kill their own family. The case took place in the city of Broken Arrow, which is in the state of Oklahoma, central region of the United States. Being the fourth largest city in the state, it was there that the Bever family lived, made up of the couple David and April Bever and their seven children, Robert, 18, Michael, 16, Crystal, 13, Daniel, 12, Christopher, 6, Victoria, 5, and Autumn, 2. There is not much information about the family or personality of each of them, it was only confirmed by some neighbors that the Beavers were recluses and were hardly seen in the neighborhood. At the time of the case, David worked in the IT department of a large company and received a good salary. People who worked with him described him as quiet but quite friendly. As for education, the Beavers never attended school, having always been educated at home. And it wasn't just school that they didn't go to, they also weren't seen playing with other children, only among themselves and only in their own backyard. This overprotection had a reason, David, the father, had suffered sexual abuse at school when he was a child, causing great trauma and a constant fear that the same thing would happen to his children. Despite not having contact with real people, children used the internet without any type of supervision, and parents didn't care who they talked to or how much time they spent on the computers, tablets and cell phones they had. At that time, TikTok or Twitch didn't exist yet, so children and young people at the time spent most of their time on YouTube. In addition to watching content about Star Wars and Minecraft, older brother Robert launched his own vlog channel, where he talked about music, video games, nothing out of the ordinary. Robert was very close to Michael, and the two talked a lot about everything they watched. Those who knew the family said that Michael was like Robert's shadow, he followed his brother and did everything he told him. After a while, Robert's tastes changed, he began to research a lot about crimes, murders, serial killers, and especially mass shootings, always sharing everything he found interesting with Michael. It could have just been a morbid teenage curiosity, if it weren't for the ideas that Robert began to share with his brother, in addition to their admiration for killers like Ted Bundy, Richard Ramirez, and the Columbine shooters, they wanted to become famous for killing as many as possible. Of people, record all deaths and post them on the internet. In addition to everything they saw on the internet, they started watching over and over again a 2009 film called Rampage, Thirst for Revenge, in which a man who hates society believes he must eliminate part of the population. The film served as inspiration for the brothers to start creating a plan that, according to them, would go down in history. At that time, ironically, Robert worked at a Christian call center where he offered prayers to callers. With his salary, he wanted to buy weapons and protective clothing to build a costume like the one from the movie Rampage. He and his brother started by buying several knives for different uses, bulletproof vests and protective helmets. They even bought everything online and received it at home. The one who didn't like seeing all that at home was her older sister, Crystal. She told her parents what the two of them were buying, but they told her not to worry because it was just boy stuff. As soon as Robert turned 18 he also started buying guns and ammunition. Shortly before the crime, Robert bought a shotgun, two Glock pistols and a lot of ammunition. Robert and Michael knew that when these goods arrived, the parents wouldn't act so nice, and they decided they needed to get rid of them all before that happened. In a notebook that Robert kept under his bed, he and his brother had written down their entire plan in detail, to murder their own family, take their father's car and go across the country shooting whoever they found. On July 22, 2015, between 11 and 11.30 p.m., Crystal went to Michael and Robert's room to tell them that their mother wanted them to go wash the dishes. However, when she opened the door, the two were putting on protective clothing and left several knives on the bed. At this point, Michael asked Robert should we do this now, and he replied yes. At that moment, Robert went up to her and stabbed her several times in the neck. The two thought Crystal was going to die instantly, but she started screaming and managed to escape. The mother, April, went to see what was happening and saw her daughter bloodied. She also started screaming and asking someone to call emergency services when Robert went at her and struck her several times. 
April was the first fatal victim. At that moment the rest of the family saw what was happening and each brother ran to one side. Robert ordered Michael to go after Crystal while he went after the other brothers. Michael obeyed, found Crystal lying near the garage, dragged her inside and locked her inside one of the rooms. Two of the brothers, Christopher and Victoria, locked themselves in a bathroom. Michael went to the door and told him that Robert was attacking everyone and that he needed to go inside to hide. When Christopher opened it, Michael killed them both. Daniel, another brother, hid in his father's office, from there he called 911 and said that his brothers were attacking the rest of the family. He managed to give the house address, but, in the middle of the call, Michael knocked on the door and used the same excuse to get his brother to open it. When he opened the door, Michael took the phone out of his hand and told Robert he's all yours. Robert entered and attacked Daniel to death. David, who was sleeping, woke up and went downstairs to see what was happening. When he saw blood, people lying everywhere and Robert with a knife in his hand, he went after his son, but he was faster and managed to stab his father to death. At that moment, the two heard the police knocking on the door, they grabbed their backpacks, ran out the back door and hid in a patch of woods there. In total there were five victims, David, 28 stab wounds, April, 48 stab wounds, Daniel, 21 stab wounds, Christopher, 21 stab wounds, and Victoria, 23 stab wounds. As soon as the police entered the house, one of the detectives heard a faint voice asking for help, it was Crystal, she had survived and was quickly taken away by paramedics. When they went up to the top floor, they found another survivor, Little Autumn, who was still sleeping. In the initial plan, Robert said that they would also kill the younger sister, but that they had to escape first. The police used dogs to sniff out the tracks and found the two brothers hiding in the woods. When the officers said hands up, Robert quickly turned himself in, but Michael would not comply. The police then released a police dog which jumped and dragged him outside. The two were taken to be questioned separately. It was at this time that it became very evident what each brother's personality was like, while Michael seemed sad and tried to put all the blame on his brother, Robert was happy and told in detail what each of the deaths were like. At the time of the crime, Robert was 18 and Michael was 16. According to Oklahoma state law, even though he was a minor, Michael would be tried as an adult due to the seriousness of his crimes. Robert, who was already of age, was eligible for the death penalty. It was proposed that Robert would not face the death penalty if he found himself guilty of the deaths, and he accepted. He was sentenced to five life sentences, one for each victim, without the possibility of parole, plus an additional sentence for the attempted murder of Crystal. Unlike his brother, Michael pleaded not guilty. During the trial, Crystal served as a witness for the prosecution, while Robert testified for the defense, according to him, Michael had not stabbed anyone and only convinced the brothers to open the door out of fear. The problem was that, in addition to contradicting what he had said during the interrogation, the scientific police had already confirmed what each person had done through fingerprints and also blood, because Michael had accidentally cut himself with the knife he was holding. Using it had transferred his blood to Christopher and Victoria. Michael's defense claimed that the brothers suffered physical and psychological abuse, mainly from their father. This ended up being corroborated by Crystal, who actually confirmed that David was attacking his children, but that this had decreased a lot over time. A moment highlighted by the brothers was when David grabbed Michael, who suffered from a stutter, by his clothes and said shut up and only speak when you know how to speak properly. Before the sentence was read, Michael spoke saying he was sorry and wished he had done things differently. He was sentenced to the same sentence as his brother, however, with the possibility of parole after 38 years. The house where the massacre took place spent years on sale, and even with a price well below the market, no one wanted to buy it, until, in 2017, it was destroyed by fire. Police believe it was arson, but have been unable to find any clues to the culprit. A month later, the local community raised funds to build a memorial garden in honor of those who died in the attack. During the inauguration, the local community representative said, Good will always prevail in the face of evil, no matter how much evil tries to break you. Regarding the brothers lives in prison, 
it was revealed that, in 2019, Robert tried to attack two prison employees with a blunt object, but he was detained. He is serving his sentence at the Joseph Harp Correctional Center in Lexington, Oklahoma. As for Michael, there is not much information, just that he is detained at the Lexington Assessment and Reception Center, also in Oklahoma. As for Crystal and Aum, almost nothing is known about them after the crime, only that they were living with their grandparents. Christmas should be a time to get together and celebrate with family and friends, but that wasn't exactly what happened to an American family in 1929. Today we're going to try to understand the case of the Lawson family, a massacre at Christmas. Charles Davis Lawson was born on May 10, 1886. His parents were Augustus and Nancy, and they lived in a community called Lawsonville in Stokes County, North Carolina. In 1911, he married Fanny Manring, with whom he had eight children, Marie, 17, Arthur, 16, Carrie, 12, Mabel, 7, James, 4, Raymond, 2, and Mary Lou, 4. Months. The other son, William, died at the age of 6 in 1920. In 1918, two of Charles's brothers named Marion and Elijah moved from Lawsonville to the village of Germantown, and Charles decided to follow them because they could have more opportunities for himself and his family. There is little information about the family's life, but what is possible to understand is that the Lawsons worked on a farm that grew tobacco and gradually managed to save money to buy their own farm in 1927. A few days earlier, it's not quite clear how many, Charles, who was 43, took his wife and children into town to buy new clothes and take a family portrait. Some sources say that, before the portrait was taken, Charles said it was a Christmas surprise. On December 25th, while the women were preparing supper, Charles went hunting with his son Arthur and the family's two dogs. In the middle of the activity, the ammunition ran out and he asked his son to go to town to buy more. Meanwhile, he went to the farm's barn and waited patiently. Two of his daughters, Carrie and Mabel, passed close to him when they were going to their aunt and uncle's house and he shot them both. To ensure they were dead, he used a shotgun to savagely beat them and then took the bodies to the barn. After that he returned home and shot his wife, Fanny, who was on the porch. The other children heard the sound of gunshots and went to hide. Charles entered the house and shot Marie, James, and Raymond. Finally, he killed baby Mary Lou, beaten to death with the shotgun. After that, he left the house. The exact chronology of what happened next is somewhat confusing, as much information is missing. What is known is that someone went to the farm because of the noise of the gunshots and found the bodies, which had their arms crossed and stones under their heads. The story quickly circulated among neighbors and many went to the scene. While there, they heard a gunshot sound coming from a nearby forest. A police officer rushed to the scene and found Charles Lawson, who had killed himself and left a farewell letter for his parents, as well as a note in his pocket reading, Don't blame anyone but me. Arthur, the son who had gone to buy ammunition in the city, was the only survivor. The bodies were buried in the Browder family cemetery on December 27. More than 5,000 people attended the funeral, many attracted by the bizarre story of the crime. According to reports from people close to them, the family was working on renovating the farmhouse when Charles accidentally hit himself in the forehead with an axe. After that, he would have started to show more aggressive and violent behavior, something that was not his personality. He had also complained to the family doctor about headaches and insomnia. Changes in behavior after head injuries are not rare, they have been reported in other famous cases such as Richard Ramirez and John Wayne Gacy. When someone suffers a blow to the head, a stroke or has a neurodegenerative disease, it is almost certain that they will experience some sequelae, which will depend greatly on the location affected, the type of injury and the intensity. Many people think that each area of the brain is responsible for only one thing, but in reality this is not the case. The areas have a certain specificity, that is, they have some functions that are more concentrated in some regions. One of these areas is the frontal lobe, which, as the name suggests, is right at the front of our head. This lobe has some divisions according to the functions it is responsible for, and one of these divisions is the prefrontal cortex. 
The prefrontal cortex is very important because it manages higher cognitive functions such as planning, organization, problem solving, self-control and also the regulation of emotions. If someone suffers a blow that affects the prefrontal cortex, they may experience some problems in these functions, for example, becoming more irritable, more impulsive, having greater difficulty controlling their emotions. Most people who exhibit these behaviors do not reach the point of being extremely violent, largely because they are undergoing treatment and these consequences are stabilized. But there are cases in which, due to lack of correct treatment, these consequences lead the person to become increasingly aggressive, to the point of even killing someone. Of course, it is a set of things happening, not just the sequelae of the injury, because in psychology we cannot treat the phenomenon as something isolated, but rather having several causes impacting it, causes that can indeed be biological, as is the case of a sequelae of brain injury, but also psychological and social causes, which are just as important. There were rumors that the family was actually killed by a third person, and that Charles was used as a scapegoat. According to theories, those responsible for this would be organized crime. Months earlier, Charles would have witnessed something and was sworn to death, although it is never clear from the sources what he would have seen. Another possible killer would be a man with whom Charles had a disagreement some time before, but there is no further information about this. In 1990, the book White Christmas, Bloody Christmas, by authors M. Bruce Jones and Trudy J. Smith, was released, which launched a new theory about the case. According to them, Charles had an incestuous relationship with his eldest daughter, Marie. In 1989, the authors received a call from an anonymous woman who led them to a family relative, Stella Lawson, Marie's cousin. Stella said she heard from her own mother during the family funeral that Fanny was worried about the closeness between her husband and daughter. In 2006, another book about the case was released, The Meaning of Our Tears, with an interview with Ella May, one of Marie's best friends. She stated that a few weeks before Christmas, Marie told her that she was pregnant and that it was her father's, and that Charles and Fanny knew it. This claim was corroborated by a neighbor of the family named Hill Hampton. After World War I, the world economy was generally shaken, as many nations spent a lot of money during the conflict. One of these nations was the United States, which although it was not one of the main countries in that war, participated on the Triple Entente side, which would be the winners. In 1929, 11 years after World War I, the American economy was in full swing, producing above capacity, even for export. Americans took the opportunity to expand their lifestyle, always wanting the best of the best. But not everyone had the money for this, so banks started offering credit without any type of regulation, even to those who were unable to pay. Another thing that was happening was that, as the conflict took place in Europe, many countries' economies were shaken and were unable to rebuild. The United States, which was doing very well, then began to lend a lot of money to its allies, who also happened to not be paying back. Furthermore, to take advantage of this economic boom, many people began to invest heavily in the stock market. Even with all this happening, there was practically no monitoring by the banks themselves or the government of how much everyone owed, and that was precisely the mistake, with so many people owing, investors started to get scared that something would happen, and decided to sell actions in the hope of not incurring losses. On October 28, 1929, this reached its peak, with 33 million shares put up for sale. The next day, with everyone selling and no one buying, the stock market crashed, meaning shares that were worth millions of dollars were now worth almost nothing. Many companies that had all their capital invested in the stock market went bankrupt. As a result, unemployment increased significantly, jumping from 4% to 27%. As a result, purchasing power decreased drastically, and producers, who already had excess stock, no longer had anyone to sell to. Many people ran to the banks to try to save their money, and they, who had already suffered losses from many loans that were not paid, also went bankrupt. It is known that the Lawson family was not rich, but they managed to lead a slightly comfortable life. One theory says that Charles lost all the money his family had during the crisis, and that's why he decided to kill his entire family to free them from the consequences. Despite being a plausible theory, it was never proven that he had money invested, 
and there is also no record of any debt or charges for the family, even after his death. A very bizarre thing happened some time after the murders. Charles's brother decided to make money from the case and opened the Lawson house as a kind of macabre tour. He charged 25 cents, today it would be $4.50, for the tour, and the money was used to pay off the mortgage on the land. According to reports, more than 500 people visited the site per day. One of the attractions of this tour was a cake that Marie had made for supper, and which was still on the table when the murders occurred. According to reports, visitors were taking pieces of this cake and taking it as souvenirs. Later, the cake was placed inside a glass dome and left exposed for years. There is a song based on the case, it is called The Murder of the Lawson Family, and it was originally recorded by the band Carolina Buddies in 1930 and re-recorded by the Stanley Brothers in March 1956. It was also recorded for the Christmas album Christmas Queens 3 by the drag artist Queen Sharon Needles in 2017. Arthur Lawson, the only survivor, died in a car accident in 1945, aged 31, leaving behind a wife and four children. A crime that shocked the community of Cheshire, Connecticut, when two criminals broke into the Petit family home and committed a series of heinous acts in what would become known as the most brutal home invasion in the United States. Furthermore, the police, who were not used to crimes in the area, made a series of mistakes that further damaged the situation. William Petit and his wife Jennifer lived. William was an endocrinologist and Jennifer was a pediatric nurse, and the two met when they were in college. The couple had two daughters, Haley, 17, and Michaela, 11 at the time of the case. Haley was described as very determined and intelligent. When her mother was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis she was just nine years old and with the help of family and friends, she created a fund called Haley's Hope, raising more than 55,000 U.S. dollars and holding an annual walk in the city to raise awareness about the disease. Her dream was to follow her father's career, and she was already ready to study medicine at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. Michaela was the youngest sister and was described by her family as very affectionate and kind. She loved cooking and gardening, as well as being very close to her grandparents. By the time Haley went to college, she was already planning to open a new fund called Michaela's Miracle to continue her sister's work. While the family lived normally, they could not even imagine that they were being watched by two men who were waiting for everyone to go to sleep before entering the house. Joshua Komisarczewski, or Josh as he was called, spent much of his life in and out of prison on robbery charges. In 2007, he was 26 years old and dating a young woman named Caroline Messel, who was 18 years old. Their relationship was serious and they even thought about getting married, but Caroline's father did not approve of their relationship as he considered Josh a bad influence due to his reputation as a criminal. Furthermore, he didn't like the age difference between them and considered Josh a pedophile who was only interested in his daughter because she looked younger. In 2006 Josh met Stephen Hayes while they were in a halfway house in Hartford. Josh was addicted to meth and Stephen was addicted to crack. According to their criminal records, Josh's specialty was a home invasion, while Stephen preferred breaking into cars. Both stole high-value items from the locals and fled. At the time, Stephen lived with his mother and two brothers, whose relationship was terrible. He was described by his brothers as manipulative, violent, cunning, and calculating. In 1992, Hayes had a daughter from a brief relationship. Stephen's daughter lived with her mother, but she saw her father weekly. In interviews, she said that he was always affectionate with her and that it didn't even occur to her that he could display a violent or aggressive side. The day before they broke into the Petit family home, Josh convinced Stephen that home invasion was an easy and quick way to make money. When Stephen saw Josh break into a house and leave with objects without being caught, he agreed, believing that no one would get hurt, but Josh's plans were different. The afternoon of July 22, 2007, was a quiet Sunday for the Putti. The family had gone to church in the morning, William played golf with his father in the afternoon, while Haley was with a group of friends at the beach. Meanwhile, Jennifer and Michaela went to a supermarket to buy ingredients for a special dinner that Michaela planned to make for her family. After dinner, everyone watched TV and went to sleep, and William ended up sleeping on the sofa in the living room. 
At around 3 a.m. on July 23rd, Josh and Stephen broke into the home with a pistol and a baseball bat. As soon as they entered, they found William sleeping. Josh hit him in the head with the bat several times, tied him to the couch and told him not to scream or attract attention, as they just wanted money. Josh asked where the house's safe was, but William said the family didn't have one. The two bandits went upstairs, woke up the women and tied each one up in her room, placing a pillowcase over their heads. Again, they were warned not to make noise, ensuring that no one would be hurt and that they only wanted money. After tying up the women, the two went down and took William to the basement and tied him to a pillar. Because of blood loss, William was partially unconscious. Josh and Stephen searched the house for the money, but, just as William had said, there was no safe. Instead, they found some bank statements that showed the family had money saved in a bank. Then Josh's plan changed, they would take Jennifer to the bank as soon as it opened and force her to withdraw $15,000. Before the bank opened, Stephen went to a gas station with two gallons he had found at the family home. The idea was to take the family to the car and burn the house to remove any trace of their presence. When the bank opened, Stephen took Jennifer there. She went to the cashier and passed a note to the attendant asking for money. The attendant realized that it was a kidnapping, but Jennifer said that the bandits were being nice and just wanted money. After giving the money, the teller's wife passed the note to the bank manager, who immediately called the police. Police were dispatched to the address using unmarked vehicles. Instead of invading the place to free the hostages, they preferred to hide and observe the house from a certain distance. While Stephen was with Jennifer at the bank, Josh raped Michaela and took explicit photos of her with his cell phone. When the two returned, Josh told Stephen to rape Jennifer, and he followed orders. Josh then went to the basement to ensure William was tied up, but realized he had managed to escape. Furthermore, the two saw cars stopping near the house and concluded that the police were already at the scene. While Josh and Stephen committed the rapes, William, despite being seriously injured, managed to get to a neighbor's house. This neighbor almost didn't recognize him because of so much blood that had run down his face. He called the police, but was told they were already at the scene. Unfortunately, it was already too late for the women of the Petit family. Stephen strangled Jennifer to death after the abuse. Then, one of the two threw gasoline everywhere and one lit fire, and this included Haley and Michaela, who were still tied to the beds. The two tried to escape, but as soon as they left the garage, they were caught by the police. When the firefighters arrived, it was too late, the fire had already taken over the house. In total, three people died, Jennifer, who was strangled, Haley and Michaela who died from smoke inhalation upstairs. Forensics concluded from the position of Haley's body that she was burned alive and tried to escape the flames, but without success. William was taken to the hospital and managed to survive. At the police station, Stephen told the detectives everything in detail. The two only disagreed about who set the house on fire, blaming each other. At that moment, the case was already having national repercussions, Little Cheshire was shaken by everything that happened, and the residents held a vigil for the deaths of Jennifer, Haley, and Michaela. The two criminals agreed to try to make a plea deal to receive life in prison without parole, but this was not accepted by the state, which decided to seek the death penalty through a jury trial. The first person tried was Stephen Hayes in October 2010. His lawyer told the jury that life in prison would be the worst punishment for his client, who would be forced to live with the guilt of his actions for the rest of his life. However, the jury decided for execution. Stephen apologized for his actions and said death for me will be a welcome relief. I hope it brings some peace and comfort to those I have wronged so much. Josh was tried a year later, in October 2011. During the hearing, he said that he had not planned to kill anyone that night, and that all that occurred was a home invasion gone wrong. Again the jury decided on the death penalty. Josh's defense filed an appeal claiming that the trial could not have taken place in Cheshire, as the jury members would have been residents of the city and would have been influenced by the environment and the media. Furthermore, they claimed that Josh was always shown as the criminal mastermind, when in fact the worst acts were committed by Stephen. 
the request was denied and the judge said they both bore equal responsibility for what happened that night. Stephen never attempted to appeal the death penalty. In an interview for the documentary The Cheshire Murders, Thomas Ullman, the defense lawyer, said that Stephen wanted to die, but his job, however difficult it was, was to try to reduce his client's sentence. In 2015, there was a turnaround regarding the defendant's sentences, Connecticut abolished the death penalty throughout its territory, including cases that had already been tried. Because of this, Stephen Hayes and Joshua Komisarczewski were automatically sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The defendant's lawyers blamed the Connecticut Parole Board, which granted release to their clients a few months before the crime. According to them, the two could never be on the streets due to their extensive record of crimes. The police were criticized for not having entered the house sooner. In the documentary The Cheshire Murders, other members of the Petit family, including Jennifer's sister, said that if the police had done something, they would all be alive. In response, police said that because they were dealing with a hostage situation, they could not enter the location until they knew how many attackers were inside. Officers were also instructed not to approach Stephen when he got out of his car after taking Jennifer to the bank. Speaking of the bank, he was also accused of negligence for letting Jennifer leave the place, even after knowing it was a kidnapping. The case was last updated in 2021, when the Connecticut Supreme Court rejected an appeal from Joshua Komisarjewski. Josh and Stephen remain in prison. What happened to the Petit family forever changed the town of Cheshire, once a peaceful place. Haley and Michaela's trusts continue to exist today. Every year, a vigil led by the Cheshire Lights of Hope movement is held to remember the souls of Jennifer, Haley, and Michaela Petit. The Petit Family Foundation organization also provides services to the city's neediest population, providing different social services, donating food, and offering scholarships in the name of the Petit family. As previously stated, William Petit managed to survive. For years he tried to ensure that Josh and Stephen served the death penalty for their crime, even after the state abolished that sentence. William has remarried and has a son. He ran as a Republican for the state of Connecticut and is still in charge of the foundation that bears his family's name.